This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live. Your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Tuesday, August 25th, wherever and however you're connected. Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with a guy who already has his cardboard cutout selfie ready for college football, Jerem Jordan. Okay, Major League Baseball has done this. They've called it the Seat Fleet uh, for the Mariners. You can pay 30 bucks and have a picture of yourself or, uh, you know, your kid or whatever. They don't take pictures of other people, although I don't know how they know to verify that. Anyway, it, you wear Mariner swag and you can get in. M- MLB teams are doing this, right? You pay a price, you get in there. It's, ki- it, it's kind of cool. It makes it... Feel like you're there, and if a foul ball hits that cardboard cutout, at least for the Mariners, then they will send you the ball. Oh, that's awesome. So with college football, there's this idea out there that maybe this could be a thing. So Texas uh, apparently is doing this. Brett McMurphy said Texas fans can purchase Texas fan cutouts of themselves or their pets. That's funny. For 50 bucks. Photos must be approved by school. Cutouts will be displayed at all Longhorn home football games. Not required to wear the mask. The Rock responds, as you can see on TV, (laughs) where do we pay? And it's a picture of Taysom's hurdle in 2014. (laughs) That's very funny. I'm guessing that Texas won't approve BYU's submission. Well, I, I I wonder if BYU is going to do something like this because uh, I think some fans, it'll be like, yeah, I'm going to help support the program financially. I can't be there, but I'll sort of be there through my picture being there. And then uh, I say if a ball goes in the stands and hits, hits the cardboard cutout, you get that football. You get the football? You get the football, like Arena Football League thing here. Yeah, not often does a football go really into the, the stands. Field. That's why they have the net, because guess what? The Rock, they're keeping that ball. They're not throwing it back. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, I'm running for the hills. Taysom Hill, still haunting Texas in 2020. Here's today's show lineup. Will the 2020 season present BYU football its best chance to ever make a New Year's Six bowl game? Okay, here we go. Blue goggles. Hold We're on. going there today. Where the, can you hand me the blue goggle alert? Blue goggle Thank alert. You. There you are. Blue goggle alert. Required. Blue mm-hmm. goggle alert. Mm-hmm. Cam Meller of SB Nation joins us live to examine what BYU is capable of this year, specifically quarterback Zach Wilson. And ESPN's A team is going to join BYU in Annapolis. Hey, hey! Details on that in a moment. The best to ever wear number 95 in Provo. And don't forget a not top five Tuesday. Oh, boy. This could be painful for hey. some BYU fans. Hell. <laughs> And hopefully uh, we'll draw a laugh or two. But first, today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. Ball camp continues today. Official preparations for Navy begin very soon. Cougars have been training for four weeks, doing voluntary workouts with limited interruptions since June. BYU preparing for Navy, which is less than two weeks away. In two weeks, we will know the results and be talking about it the next day on this program. ESPN's A-list college football broadcast duo of Chris Fowler and Kirk Herbstreet will... Call BYU at Navy in Annapolis on Labor Day night. How about that? This, according to Herb Street's interview with 1045 The Zone in Nashville yesterday, home to Herb Street, Monday night BYU football on ESPN with Fowler and Herbie kicks off in uh, how many days again? Countdown to Navy. 13 days. Gosh, I'm not used to that pace still. We're running a high tempo offense. Is Robert and I calling the plays here? Thirteen Bob, are you back days. There? Hey, you uh, already put your blue goggles on once. Why not throw them on again? Get your blue goggles on for this one as well. The college football playoff dates have been announced. It's a slow day. The selection <laughs> committee will announce the matchups on December twentieth for the Rose and Sugar Bowls uh, to be played on New Year's Day. The national championship game will be. There's a little refraction here, so I'm like, what does it say? National championship game will be played on January eleventh. <laughs> In Miami. My oversized blue goggles are uh, refracting things in strange ways. I went to uh, the aquarium locally here on Saturday, and I was like, wow, the refraction through this thick glass is extreme. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, I've never thought, I haven't thought about refraction in a while. You need some serious refraction to see some things through the blue goggles. Yes. Right. And then, and then I can do what my mom does and hold the phone out like right here. <laughs> like, oh, that's it. You have to place it just right yeah. to see what you want to see. What? Why? Why? And then the face is always like this. It's always like, like why? <laughs> Such why? a strain. It's painful. How about a baseball promotion today? According to Mark Zuckerman of Masson Sports, 
Not Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, different guy. Mark less Zuckerman. Less money. Of MAS. Less controversy. Former BYU star Jackson Klopp invited to the Washington Nationals alternate training site. The taxi squad, baby. The taxi squad. That's right. Clough will head to Fredericks- Fredericksburg, Virginia, and join up with the squad. This move was prompted by recent injuries on the Nationals roster. So basically, each Major League team has a team that is within 90 minutes of the home site so that if there's an issue, COVID, injury, otherwise, they can bring one of these minor leaguers up. Um, I'd be shocked if Jackson Clough got the to the majors this year. That'd be like quite a stretch. So the fact that he's in that group is pretty awesome because they basically scrimmage, practice, train um, because they don't have a minor league season. But this is awesome for Jack. It's a great backup plan for Major League Baseball. Just ask the Miami Marlins, the Philadelphia Phillies, and the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah. Yeah. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. Refract this. 76 Division I college football teams are set to compete in the fall of 2020. No Big Ten, no Pac-12, no Mountain West, no Mid-American. We're in a world with no maxion. That leaves 76 teams and 12 spots in the New Year's Six. That's a Music Man lyric here. Of course... The probability of bowl games is an entirely different subject of its own. But while the New Year's Six is still in play, Jerem, I present the following question. Is this BYU's best opportunity (laughs) to make make the New Year's Six or the college football playoff? The answer, shockingly, is yes. Wow. Uh, But it ain't happening. Come on. Let's talk about it. It's mathematical. Yes, it is. Let's, Let's talk about it. Okay. We think this is going to be a better BYU team that's based off of young guns who have played and started, who have freshmen and sophomores who are now juniors and seniors for the most part on offense and defense. That's great. We thought BYU would at least be an eight-win team going into the season, if not nine. Ten feels a little crazy given the schedule BYU had. Well, it's a different schedule now, a much weaker schedule. Uh, Who knows how many games everyone's going to play. And the fact that there are two Power 5 leagues not playing, obviously that opens up some options. So... We didn't say the college football, well, I guess we said CFP. That's not happening for a non-Power 5 team ever, in my opinion. I just don't think it's going to happen. Particularly not this year and against this schedule for BYU. What about Notre Dame? They're a Power 5 equivalent. They're playing an ACC schedule. BYU is not a Power 5 equivalent in this. BYU is in scheduling too many leagues. Don't confuse those two. Okay? So let's talk about it. So New Year's 6. That means there's six bowl games. There's 12 teams. Uh, This year there are three auto bids to Power 5s because the other two aren't playing. There's a group of five best of things, so that's four automatic bids. That means there's eight at-large bids, if you will, to the New Year's Six because the Rose and Sugar are the semifinal games. So the Big Ten and the Pac-12 will not be participating in in fall football, and so those semifinals would have been occupied by other teams in maybe any way. Is it BYU's best opportunity? Yes, there are fewer teams available and whatnot. I just don't believe that BYU actually do that. I believe that BYU has to be undefeated to be in the conversation. Let's clear up something that is often misunderstood. A lot of people think that BYU is grouped in with the non-Power Fives into this automatic bid opportunity. Oh, if they're the highest finishing group of five team. Wait, they're not a group of five team. Correct. BYU is not a group of five team. They do not qualify in the same way that, say, Boise State or Memphis or Cincinnati do. They do not. BYU has chosen to be an independent. They are also independent from that opportunity to be the the best group of five teams. So how does BYU make a New Year's Six bowl game? One, they have to go undefeated in my opinion. I don't think that a one-loss BYU gets in over a one-loss Power Five team or, frankly, even a two-loss. Let's say LSU lost to Alabama and somebody else. I think that LSU would probably get in over BYU, especially over this schedule. So, yes, there are uh, uh, you know eight opportunities, perhaps, to get into a at-large uh, situation. But I, it's just, you're going to have to out at large, eight other teams. Those are power five teams who, in the eyes of the college football playoff committee, who make the decision on these uh, as well, by the way, with those bowls. I, ju- I just don't see that how that happened. Is it BYU's best opportunity? Y- yes. Mathematically, yes. Yes, but I, ju- I just don't see BYU going undefeated this year. 12 teams out of 76 are going to be in a projected New Year's Six. And you, you, that's the right word. Because we don't know what's exactly going to happen with all these bowl games. 12 
out of 76. So that is roughly one-sixth to one-seventh yeah. of a chance. So what was that, 15%, something 15. like that? 15.78. Now, I want to point something out. Spencer is crazy good at percentages like that. <laughs> like, you're crazy good at that. I'm like, holy shnikes. Yeah, you're the human calculator with that. Yeah. 15 percent roughly of getting into a New Year's Six bowl game like that's not bad and normally it's what 12 out of 130 go ahead tell me what it is 12 out of 130 (laughs) oh man that's gonna be eight or nine (laughs) percent it's nine percent I told you (laughs) nine percent that's great dude I need to take a math class at BYU by the way (laughs) you you're the real winner because you didn't have to Uh, I feel lucky Okay, so yes, mathematically the chances are better. Hold on, mathematically or mathematically? Mathematically. Okay, yeah. like athlete. Sorry. I just said mathematically. Atho- like what is it? Bench warmers. But the- athlete. But there is an e uh, uh, in between math and matically. Ooh, mathematically. Uh huh. Okay, we're discovering things here. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Tangent. <laughs> Speaking of math, tangent. <laughs> BYU is going to have to be ranked in the top twelve. To even be in the conversation, Jim. Right. And to be ranked in the top 12, Undefeated. you got to go unbeaten. Yeah. You have to go unbeaten because a 7-1 and one team, based on the six official games and two reported games, is not going to be a top 12 team in college football. Well, because BYU will have not, one, played anybody. Except Navy, yeah, Navy and Houston. But Navy and Houston aren't going to be in the conversation for some of the best teams in the country. They're now, not. BYU added App State and Cincinnati a couple of road games. And it's like, oh. Then it's more interesting. Okay. But the Power Fives are going to say, you didn't play any Power Fives. What Boise State does is they play one Power Five, beat them, and then they go, well, they've beaten everybody, including that one team. Okay? That's how it works. Even if that one Power Five team is, yeah. Like Utah 04 played North Carolina and somebody. They didn't really play any. They at least played somebody. Uh, BYU in 84. They at least played Pitt on the road and like Michigan, although those teams didn't end up turning out that good. And Baylor. um, You at least went out and played it. BYU's not going to have anybody that the Power Fives are going to go, oh, yeah, BYU's totally legit. No. Even if BYU runs the table on the current schedule. Granted, maybe BYU adds somebody of note or two. Then they have a shot. I just don't believe BYU is going to go undefeated. I don't think this is a team that will do that. I think this could be a pretty good team, and we'll discuss the, uh, you know, why sh- why should or should not BYU be a good team this year based on who they're playing. But I that I hope BYU comes out with like two or three losses or less, and I'll, we'll call it good. I don't see this being the undefeated season. This isn't '84, bro. Like it ain't. Sorry, blue goggles are fixed. It ain't happening. I like BYU's. Uh, quarterback situation. Absolutely. I like the offense in general. I really like the offensive line. I like the experience that BYU brings back on defense. But I am traumatized, and my group of five anxiety levels are higher based on <laughs> what has happened against these teams in the last three years. Yes, and we will address this more coming up later in the program. Stay tuned for that. We're going to discuss the the word should and why we are perhaps abusing it in this conversation. Or maybe it's fair. Or maybe it's fair. That said, Jerem, both you and I yesterday agreed that at minimum, based on the eight games, six official, two reported, BYU should go at least six and two, if not seven and one. Yes, because it's not like BYU has a team. There are not a ton of teams that can jump up and surprise BYU, in my opinion. Granted, this happens every year. South Florida wasn't a thing we saw coming. Toledo we thought was going to be an interesting game. That's a six and six Toledo team. That's a four and eight uh, USF USF team. team. And then San Diego State was ten and three. To me, that's an acceptable loss. And then Hawaii ends up going ten and five. It was a good team. They weren't like a barn. Break. BYU should have won the Hawaii game. BYU should have won the Toledo game and the yes. South Florida game. Yes, they did not. But when the other team has ten wins, I go, you know what? They were pretty good. It's e- easier to cope with. I, I still think BYU needs to compete better and win more of those games. But I go, ah, 10-3 and three San Diego State with like a top five defense? It happens. Our question of the day, is this season BYU's best chance at playing in a New Year's Six Bowl game? <laughs> why or why not? Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation. On BYU Sports Nation. I'll read this one. I grew up with uh, this guy, Jared Presley. What, what kind of question is this? 
No, BYU isn't going to a New Year's Six game. Reasons. One, poor strength of schedule. Two, BYU always loses it to a couple of teams they should beat. Three, there's a decent chance there won't even be a New Year's Six this year. Mm. Is this BYU's best chance? Our program's really lost. Okay. Jared, it's a, first off, hi. Uh, <laughs> second, it's the best chance because BYU is playing, uh, is one of the only teams playing out West. Now, Air Force still has Navy and Army on the schedule. Two games. By the way. So it's BYU and Air Force. But we could say BYU is the only team playing three-plus games. It is BYU's best chance mathematically. Yes. It is. It just straight is. They almost double their chances <laughs> from 9% to 15% based on the sheer number of teams still competing. Wouldn't it be poetic if this year, Jerem, when the schedule is not too hard. The pandemic playoff year. <laughs> BYU no. gets into the top 12. And has this amazing season and plays and in the Fiesta Bowl and finally. You're validated forever. Yes, I am. No <laughs> power fives equals winning. I want two to three power fives a year. But I feel like I've said that every time. The real challenge is BYU figuring out how to beat these group of five teams consistently, which has yeah, not yeah. really happened. More on this coming up. Yeah. And more coming up. Is today <laughs> the last day for coaches on back? An end of an era? An era? The trio? They even recruited somebody. And Cam Meller of SB Nation joins us. What does he think BYU football is capable of this year? Specifically quarterback Zach Wilson. This is BYU Sports Nation. Oh, he loves that. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Watch after further review with Dave McCann, Blaine Fowler, David Nixon. They explore five more players who could help win the Navy game. It's tonight, 7 Eastern, on the BYU TV app. Now it's starting to feel real, Jerem. We're under two weeks away from BYU and Navy. Again, as he mentioned, watch after further review. We are live in Studio B with your day-to-day BYU sports play-by-play. I'm Spencer Linton. Teamed up with Jerem Jordan. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline via Zoom is our friend Cam Meller of SB Nation, College Football Insider. Cam, it is wonderful to have you back on the show, and it is even more wonderful that we are discussing actual football that will be played. It's wonderful to be back. Thanks for having me. But it's it's even more wonderful to, and I was just telling you guys, to prove the naysayers wrong. To those that thought we weren't going to have some sort of college football season, we have college football this Saturday and then a full slate next week. It's, it's uh, as exciting as can be. Yeah, and I was one of those people where I was like, it sounds like we may not have this, so this is a good feeling. Uh, let's talk about this. We were talking about what we call a blue-goggled topic, meaning – Okay, does BYU have, uh, is this their best chance to make the New Year's Six? The schedule's a little weaker. We think BYU will be better. Uh, two Power Five leagues not playing. We don't know how the New Year's Six is going to play, but what are your thoughts on this crazy August 25th topic we've thrown out? <laughs> it is a little crazy. I think this is the year of a Cinderella team, of a school or independent school that gets in. I just don't know with six games and maybe even two more and eight game schedule that that warrants enough when you're going to have a team like Cincinnati if that's going to be uh, 10 and one, maybe with an ACC AAC championship game in there. So I think it's a little bit more difficult if we get these full schedules for the teams like that, those teams that are already in the top 25. And then once we drop off those big 10 and Pac 12 schools out of the top 25, these teams rocket already into the top eight, essentially UCF and Cincinnati. So I think it's a little bit more difficult. I think this helps BYU for publicity. And, and I think it gets them on the national stage a little bit more than I think they might've been usually so I think it's good overall for the season, but it's a lot more difficult with just six games guaranteed or confirmed so far to get to, to crack that national top 25 picture. BYU hopes to get to 10 to 12 games. Does that change things for you if they have that amount of games and have perhaps Absolutely. another quality group of five team on there? Absolutely. And especially if you could add one of those teams that's in the group of five conversation for best team of their conference. Uh, but it all then relies on Zach Wilson's shoulders. So uh Here's hoping that I'm right, and here's hoping that Zach is uh, is who I think he can be this year, too. Okay, you bring up uh, the topic, the quarterback, who is uh, getting ready for his junior season, Cam. We know that you love Zach. What are your expectations for him this year? Not coming off shoulder surgery and at least currently not dealing with a broken thumb. Yeah, no injuries, no gauntlet of Power 5 teams to run through to start the season. He kind of gets to to not coast into a Navy defense, but it gets to coast into the season essentially for what he's used to uh, from his previous two seasons. So I think no injuries, a healthy bill of you know offseason essentially with, with no spring ball to get himself hurt. This is a guy who beats you with his legs just as easy 
he beats you with his arms, but I think that he can, if he can rely on that shoulder and rely on some receivers to step up for him this year, Zach Wilson turns into a household name across the country. Okay, you've been big on Zach, and let's uh, let's explore that again now that he is an upperclassman. A lot of times we're like, hey, freshman or sophomore, show us something. And he's show, shown us some things, but there have been some injuries, right, and uh, tough schedules and whatnot. But you've talked about him being a, a big-time player. The numbers don't scream big-time player from last year, but you've helped clarify some of that, especially with interceptions. So what was the number again? You said six of the nine picks you didn't feel like were his fault or something from last year? I had... I had seven that I deemed were not his fault. You wow. look at it, there's receiver error, there is drops, there's misrun, misrun routes, there's different situations, passes batted at the line of scrimmage that, you know, change the trajectory. Uh, the one against Hawaii, I mean, it's thrown to the spot where the receiver's hands are. It just goes right through his hands and it's a pick. I mean, this is the one against uh, Washington, I think, maybe, or something. I forget. I, I, I've watched them so many times. They all run down. But seven of those nine were not deemed his fault. And granted, I was proven that there are a couple others that maybe he had a couple dropped interceptions too. So not quite, he should have been nine, but it shouldn't maybe have just been two either. So cleaning a little bit of that up, but I think this clean bill of health uh, and then a third year of the program, you know, you get a little bit smarter, you get a little bit better. Where do you feel like he's going to ch- take the biggest leap this year? I think it's going through the progressions. I think it's you You look at the jump from sophomore to junior. It happens from freshman to sophomore, but I think sophomore to junior, you start seeing these guys mm-hmm. understand the play calls. They're not worried about what they just said in the huddle, or they're not worried about what the coach is thinking about from the previous play. The, the, the maturity starts to age, and then you see the progression start to get a little bit field. So if number one is covered, number two is covered, he understands to dump it off or get out of the pocket and evade some run routes to defenders to, to you know gain some yards. Live and play another down, but go through your progressions a little bit better in the junior year. Cam Meller of SB Nation with us on BYU Sports Nation. Cam, you talked about the increased exposure that BYU will experience because they're playing on ESPN Monday Night Football on September 7th, and then they'll play in front of a national audience on CBS when they travel to West Point and take on Army for the first time ever. You said Zach Wilson could become a household name. Are the two games enough for Zach to propel himself into the national spotlight based on those TV windows? I think so. I think absolutely. I think Monday Night Football, essentially, this is going to be one of the more watched games, uh, not of just week one, but like season. It's Monday Night Football, for crying out loud. Get it on TV. Navy has a a very distinct and unique large following, as does Army. So I think these two, maybe they're not the biggest of the of the schools in terms of, of group of five or independent play that you can have. But I do think that those such unique, distinct followings and then such a and this is huge for their offense or their defense as well, not just for Zach. So I think Zach can, can do what he can do against these defenses, but also for the BYU defense to sort of prove that they are maybe a little bit better than last year and stop their those tricky option offenses that each of those two are going to run. So that, that's probably an underrated aspect of these games too. What other individuals uh, are you looking at the first couple of weeks? Uh, Brady Christensen, left tackle. He's another guy. If Zach doesn't vault himself into, you know, a household name, Brady Christensen can prove that he is a first round talent this season as well. And I think against some of these talented edge rushers that Army always presents and Navy presents too, this is uh, this is Brady Christensen time to just sort of set the edge. Uh, and then other than that, Matt Bushman. I mean, who doesn't want to watch Bushman play? Maybe even James Empey as well, sort of solidify the fact that he is one of the top interior linemen uh, for the next year's draft as well, but also in all of college football. So I think those three on the offensive line, I think, or those three total on offense plus Zach Wilson uh, is who I'm really looking for. Anybody on defense to count? Uh, Peyton Wilger. I mean, if you you have an amazing season last year, this guy does just about everything that you would want him to as a three down linebacker. So Another year in the system, another year of health uh, off season as well. And this is a, I think it turns into maybe the best sophomore linebacker uh, at the lower level, not the power five. And even sort of getting to that way, we've seen Carlton Marshall from Troy sort of vault himself after a sophomore year in group of five to people saying, okay, this is an NFL guy. And I think that's sort of what, where Will Guard can be after the end of the year. Cam Miller with us on BYU Sports Nation. You mentioned that this year might be the year of the Cinderella. Jeremy and I just went through the mathematics of it and – there are only 76 Division I college teams playing rather than 130. There are 12 spots in the New Year's Six, so that's a 15% chance for all of these 76 teams to somehow end up in a New Year's Six bowl game. With no Power Five, or sorry, with two Power Five conferences sitting out, is this the year that two Group of Five teams sneak into New Year's Six games, or maybe one Group of Five and an independent BYU? I, I can see two. I can see two pretty easily. I can see 
even but at that point I don't, i'm not gonna call, i'm a so i'm a ucf homer born and raised in orlando even though i didn't go there they're probably my second favorite but national i think champs, that UCF's baby. not a sim- national champ. they're recognized i just got to tell my wife about that last night about that they're actually officially recognized as a national champion nowadays <laughs> I, love I think they're not a cinderella if they make it so i think at that then yes i think there is room for another one of a group of five and then i mean byu yeah you'd have to add a few more games uh, get to even 10, I think, to to be confident. But yeah, I mean, you got to look at it. You have the Rose Bowl. It's completely open. No automatic bids there, too. So, I mean, you have that as an new new schools. Let's face it, the Pac-12 never put anybody else in there anyway. So, Pac-12, <laughs> yeah, other than the Rose Bowl, Pac-12 never put anybody else anywhere else. So, at that point, losing the Big Ten is probably the biggest asset to to the group of five, getting another school in there. Yeah, and Rose ends up being one of the semifinals, I think, this year. So those spots are unoccupied anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, who who has your uh, group of five uh, vision right now in terms of who's the best team? I thought Boise State was going to make a real run at it this year with seven home games. They had Florida State at home. They return a lot. Um, the AC is the the squad, right? App State maybe wants to make a little run here. But uh, who who in the AAC sticks out for you? It, uh, I mean, the, the main powers recently, Cincinnati and UCF, but I really am, I'm interested to see what happens uh, with USF this year. They have players returning on defense and maybe the best secondary in the group of five. So I think this is a team that if they get a little bit of plus play at the quarterback position this year, if Jordan McLeod can sort of step up and be a little bit better, uh, I think they're, they're returning some, some pretty solid players on offense. They're a little lean elsewhere, but I think their secondary you know, stops what you need to stop, and that's the pass in the AAC. So I think USF can surprise people, but I think I'd have to go chalk and say you, UCF or Cincinnati are probably the top two. App State up there as well, and then watch out for Arkansas State too. No, no Memphis love. No Memphis love. I think it's a hard loss anytime you lose your head coach, uh, and then you see what happens after that. We'll see how they utilize. Can't can't have much high hopes for them until we see maybe a week one or week two action from them. BYU obviously has Navy on the schedule out of the AAC. They also have a home game against Houston. Should BYU fans be worried about what Houston is scheduled to bring to Provo in October? It's super interesting to see who actually plays for Houston again this year. We saw them, <laughs> what, Don a bunch of seniors that played four games, took their red shirt, and now they're back, but then they lose their quarterback. So if Clayton Toon can be a little bit better than what we saw down the stretch for him when he got in for De'Aaron King, I think Toon is a solid player. Marquez Stevenson is maybe the fastest player in the entire country, so you have to be able to stop their passing attack. So I think Houston, yes, you should absolutely be pretty scared of what Houston can do on the side of the ball, and then defense is sort of a lackluster last year, but they do have some some pretty solid players in the interior as well. So I think mainly if you stop Marquez Stevenson and stop the passing attack at Houston, you have a pretty good shot at winning. Feels like the national championship game is somewhat predictable at this point, yet it's kind of fun when it isn't, right? So there seem to be three top-heavy teams, Ohio State not in the mix, or so we think, right? Uh, obviously Alabama and Clemson. Who else do you think's in the mix to compete for the national championship in this uh, unique season? You know, I, until Lincoln Riley proves me wrong, I have to assume that this is a guy that's going to field one of the better quarterbacks in the entire country whenever he trots out, whoever he trots out to be behind center. So I'll go the winner of the Red River, Red River rivalry nowadays, we have to call it, not the shootout. So Oklahoma or Texas, I think at this point, Ellinger and year what feels like year seven at Texas for Sam <laughs> Ellinger. Uh, this guy, I think... Uh, he's he's taking it there he's awesome one of the better college quarterbacks or texas quarterbacks of all time and it's such an illustrious program but he he needs something to cement it. maybe one of the best to ever do it at texas so texas can do it i'm not ready to say texas is back yet although we will hear that for sure in the coming weeks that texas is back but texas or oklahoma and i'd give the edge to oklahoma based upon their offensive line returning this year i can't wait for texas to win that opening game and hear it texas back. is back it's like really come on man yeah <laughs> Cam, great to catch up with you, man, uh, and uh, we appreciate the football insight. Uh, for those that want to read more, where can they go to read your material? Uh, SBNation.com is probably the easiest way to find me. Twitter, everything is uh, everything national at least, so Twitter, and it's just very simply Cam Meller. I'm always out there tweeting whatever I can about college football. Sounds good, man. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me again. Cam Meller on the Deseret First Credit Union Highline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. I love bringing Cam on. Great insight, great uh, you know, 
deep thought. He watches film. He assesses. And there's probably not a bigger fan of Zach Wilson outside the Wilson family than Cam Miller. He worked he with Pro Football Focus Zach for a Wilson. while. Yes. Now he's with SB Nation. Yes. He's a guy that is uh, a student of the game, no yeah, question. Absolutely. Coming up, we explore the idea that BYU should come out of this schedule relatively unscathed, despite having a losing record against Group of Fives the last three seasons. Should. 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 Plus, I can't believe we've reached this point. The final day of Coaches on Bikes? Wait, what? Why? Stay with us on BYU Sports Nation. BYU football. Clint Stocky, Coordinator's Corner, AFR. It's all on deck, baby. Coordinator's Corner comes back next week, Monday. Greg Rebell chats with coordinators, gets us ready for Navy. It's a game week, even though BYU plays huh. on Monday. It's a game week, and it starts with Coordinator's Corner next Monday. It's so wonderful. I should mention, one Eastern on the BYU TV app right after. He is Jerem. I am Spencer. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. 13 days away from BYU and Navy kicking off the season. Let's whip it. Okay, we are nearing the end of fall camp. What has stuck out from this year's unique training camp? For me, I think it is the wide receivers, Jerem. I have been pleasantly surprised with the reemergence of Neil Pau, uh, Dax Milne, who I think is the most underrated offensive player on the BYU team, and Gunnar Robney's uh, kind of ascension to the top of that wide receivers room. We were all kind of wondering, hey, who's going to be the guy that Those steps three up th- were the incumbents. When Aleva Hifo and Micah Simon and all of this talent is leaving, we all knew that Matt Bushman was going to be great, but what, what's the wide receiver room going to do? Uh, Jerem, they've, they've exceeded expectations for me, so I like them in this unique training camp. I think they've been outstanding. It's been the lack of fall camp narrative. The narrative is who is BYU going to play because we haven't focused on the nuances of fall camp. It's just been... What's the schedule going who did, who to be? Who they playing? And the fact that we're not there means that there's just less for us to see and comment on. Yeah. Who they playing, when they playing, and are they playing? <laughs> Kirk Herbstreet tells 104.5 The Zone in Nashville he will be on the call for BYU at Navy on Labor Day night. When was the last time BYU was on this big of a national stage? I mean, maybe the Cotton Bowl, but I would argue that BYU being on ABC against USC and Washington last year. Sky Cam! Even Wisconsin in 2018. Right. Those were big deals as well. Now, Monday Night Football, only game on like this. I mean, this might be the most unique situation for BYU football ever. The exposure feels unparalleled given everything that is going on. And with the thirst for football, everybody's going to be watching Monday Night Football College Football Edition. Chief Safety Tyron Honey Badger Matthew tweeted a picture of Daniel Sorensen and tagged him in the following post. Quote, the goal is to be happy with what you have. That is a gift in itself. Is this a compliment to Danny? (laughs) What is this? I think it is well-intentioned. I think Tyron Matthew really admires Daniel Sorensen. They were training camp roommates last year. I imagine they're probably doing the same thing this year. Tyron Matthew has said, Daniel Sorensen makes me want to be a better person. I want to know what they're talking about. He makes me happy. So I don't think it was like, I'm so much more talented than Danny. He's just a hard worker. Yeah, because that's what it looks like a little bit where he's like, oh, yeah, well, just be happy with the gifts you have, I guess. But Tyron Matthew has a ton of talent. Daniel Sorensen has worked very hard to stay in this position. Yeah, Danny has talent, too, and speed and agility and smarts, and he's proven it on the field most important. He has to overcome a, a grand perception there. He does. You're, it's it's very true. Right up. Very true. But I think Tyron meant well by that. All right, Jeremy. apparently all good things come to an end, including one of our favorite segments, Coaches on Bikes. Is this the finale? What's good? It's your boys. You know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You already know. Yeah, Coach G. Hey, last day of fall camp, baby. Um, our goal was to finish the fall camp riding bikes. So we completed our goal today. But we'll be back with you with a little more videos from different places. Um, because we did accomplish our goal. All right, so it's the last we day of the bike ride. Goal. We smashed the goal. A uh, couple of questions. Where's Gavin Fowler? Where's Gav? Where's Gavin? Uh, they chose the along the uh, Provo River Parkway, I think. It's a beautiful ride. Nice, yeah. And number two, 
is it really the end of fall camp? It is? Okay, whatever. It just blends into yeah, preparing it's all, for Navy. It's all good. It's all kind of just, yeah. Uh, prepare, prepare for Navy, right? Yeah. Prepare for Navy. Let's <laughs> Pre- go. We're beat on, Navy. We're on, to Navy. we're on to Navy. Bring on the best to wear it. We're counting up to 99. One or two numbers each show and determining the best athletes to wear each number in Provo at Brigham Young University. We're nearing the end. Today, it's number 95. This is a player that was better than Dennis Pitt. His name is Gordon Hudson. Gordon Hudson played from 1980 to 1983. One of the all-time greats in, in BYU history. Uh, obviously, Steve Young's running mate there. A tight end, two-time consensus All-American, 82 and 83. 1983, he only played eight games, got hurt. Still consensus All-American. Why is this in black and white? What is, this, what? is it that what? <laughs> Honorable mention All-American 81. Two-time first-team All-Wax. Second most receptions and receiving yards by a tight end oh. in BYU history. Finished his career as the NCAA record holder for career receiving yards by a tight end. And he was just unbelievable. In this UCLA game in 83, big time. Catches, uh, I believe, the game-winning score there in a big win over eventual Rose Bowl champ UCLA. Gordon Hudson was legit. And... Those numbers in the 80s are just incredible. I mean, those would stack up today. 22 touchdowns. Just got in the end zone a ton. And uh, he had 259 yards against Utah in 81. That's second most in BYU history. And he has the distinction of being the only something in BYU history, which is our stat of the day. Hmm. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Gordon Hudson is BYU's only non-quarterback player in the College Football Hall of Fame. That's incredible. Yes. Also incredible. He played eight games in 1983 and was still a consensus All-American. That's also incredible. That's also incredible. Gordon Hudson. Yeah. Number 95. Kid. You mentioned kid, Dennis Pitt off the top, Jerem. Yeah. Of course you would. What other number did Dennis wear before he wore number 32? 95. Did he wear Did He wear, he wore something in the 90s, didn't he? <laughs> well, he didn't make it in. <laughs> what, what was it? <laughs> Did he wear nine? Oh yeah, we had, we discussed this before. He his freshman year, or like ninety one or something. What was his freshman year? Oh three. <laughs> oh okay. goodness. We'll look it up. We'll get back to you. We we'll got our research team on. I love that you started it by saying somebody that was better than Dennis Pitta. Yeah. Gordon Hudson. <laughs> yes. Okay. Coming up, a not five Tuesday, not top five Tuesday. We've never attempted this before, so watch if you dare. And is a near perfect. Or even perfect season? Really possible for BYU? This is BYU Sports Nation. Here we go. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. BYU football's Kalani Sitake is back one week from today, September 1st, 8.30 Eastern, as the coach and Gregor Bell gets ready for BYU at Navy. We'll have our first deep blue of the season as well with Zach Wilson. Finishing that up right now. I watched the fourth rough draft this morning, Spencer. It's almost done. Oh, baby. <laughs> Your fourth rough draft? Oh, yeah. We're, we're hacking away and making sure it's around. awesome, man. We do not mess around. Eh, I mess around a lot. Let's go. Welcome back to the show in Studio B, and we welcome you back with this question. Why should we believe BYU could finish the football season in 2020 with one loss or even – no losses. Well, it, the, word, the word to me is should because we say, well, BYU should be this Why team. Why should, should they? Should beat that team. Why should they? Okay, a point of clarification as well. We've said 11 and 12 against G5's last three. Is, it's G5's and independents. Right. Right? So that includes UMass and Liberty and so on. So that is not good enough. BYU should probably win at least 70% of those. At least 70%. Uh, if not higher. Maybe it needs to be 75 or 80. But – who BYU is the last three years is a team that struggles with a group of five teams. And some of those teams aren't good. Some of those teams are. Let's walk through it. 2017, an abomination in BYU history. At Utah State, Boise State, at East Carolina, at Fresno State, UMass. BYU loses those games. UMass Boise and East Carolina, even in that in, season, should not happen. Inexcusable. But Utah State, it happens. Utah State is okay. better. Mm-hmm. Boise State good. is a team that's tough to beat. Uh, unless you have your third string quarterback in Fresno easy. State won ten games at Fresno State. That was a ten win Fresno State. Okay, but game. East Carolina and UMass shouldn't happen. Can't happen. Shouldn't happen. So that would have been a what six and seven yes. regular season. That's better than four and nine. Twenty eighteen Utah State at home. It was a good Utah State team with Jordan Love. I believe they won what eleven games. Yep. NIU Northern Illinois can't, can't lose happen. That. Can't lose that game. You give up seven points and lose on your home field at Boise State. That's an acceptable, understandable loss. But BYU had the ball at the two-yard line and lost. Okay. At the very end. So that's tough. 2019, at Toledo, 
at USF no. at San Diego State. No, the no. First two can't happen. San Diego State, like I said, I understand if that happens. I don't want it to. But that was a 10 win, top five defense, San Diego State. BYU right. was a better team than Toledo and USF. They yes. were a better team and lost. And lost those games. So, so I submit this idea. And I'm on the other end of it, but I just want to ask the question because I think it's important to have this dialogue is we're saying BYU should beat a lot of these teams. Why? If they're not, why should they suddenly change that behavior? Under Kalani Sitake the last three years, BYU has struggled. I, I think that BYU is close to not being in this predicament, but unfortunately they are at the moment. Um, you know, four years ago, it wasn't an issue because you had a senior-led team with Taysom Hill, Jamal Williams, Kainakua, Harvey Long. You had a side talent. You had a good group. And we've talked about it. I think it was BYU's most talented group under Kalani Sitake, including this year. We'll see that play out. Maybe, maybe it's this year. We'll see. But I don't know that they should. When it's UTSA and it's Texas State reported and it's Troy and it's whatever, those are almost th- – those are a little different to me than – Utah State or Boise State or San Diego State. They but, should be different. But And even Toledo, frankly. Toledo's been a good team. They had a uh, tough year last year, 6-6. Six six, but you cannot lose to 4-8 and eight South Florida. You cannot lose to UMass. Those would be the UTSA, the Troy, the Texas State uh, equivalents. If BYU loses to Navy, it's an understandable loss. If BYU loses to Houston, it's an understandable loss. What would be incomprehensible, again, would be Troy, Tech State, UTSA. Or Western Kentucky. Or, and North Alabama is not a loss. That's Anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah. Why, so I, I believe that BYU should beat those teams. Yet, the last three years, it has been a struggle. And so we have to ask ourselves, why? Okay. No, and that's a fair question. So here is the case for why I think BYU should win Probably every game except maybe one. I'm with you on this, okay. and I'm questioning myself in Here's this conversation. why. I think BYU has a distinct advantage, given the pandemic, of having been in a state where the government has allowed them to train and open up, and the medical team has been doing a really nice, solid, consistent job keeping these guys healthy. BYU's been practicing for a lot longer, if, whether it's official practice or not, player-run practices it's or June. not. For a lot longer than most teams. Almost three months now. This is an advantage for BYU to build chemistry, camaraderie, and from what the coaches are telling us, because we can't watch practice. So we are reliant entirely on what coaches are saying to us and the little bits of rash assumption video that we are making on the show (laughs) that the players are showing that the practice and the extra time is paying off. Now, we'll really start to find out when BYU has to go on the road and play a disciplined, tough-nosed, well-coached Navy team with head coach Ken Niamatololo. But they've been practicing for a long time, so I like BYU's advantage there. And then, Jerem, obviously, the schedule that is not playing against Utah, Michigan State, Arizona State, and Minnesota, but rather Navy, Army, Troy. Hey, that's very. It's a very different September. No excuses now. Very different September. You're not walking into the weight room with no warm up and throwing a ton of weight on there. Your your Navy's a challenge by week. Army is a little less of a challenge, uh, and then you play Troy at home, a team you should beat. BYU needs to walk out at least two and one, if not three and zero. And we asked Blaine Fowler this question yesterday as well, and he explained why he thinks BYU is primed and ready to have a potentially special season. This is the the deepest and um, and what's the best word for this? Least lacking at any position group of of all of the teams Kalani's had since he's been here. So every year we go into a season and I go, oh man, there's a glaring there's a glaring depth issue at linebacker, or what are they going to do on the D line, or oh man, this offensive line is undersized and just too young, or who's going to play running back, or man, the quarterbacks are just. There's been a position group or two. Every season since Kalani's been here, where, and, and we can go back, go back and check the tape. I've said, boy, I'm really concerned about that, or I'm really concerned about this. This is the first season when I go position group by position group. Um, there isn't a weakness, or there, it's just this glaring thing where you go, oh man, this isn't a complete team. Is this the complete team? Blaine Fowler thinks the depth is there to go along with the talent. And we've talked a lot about all of the upperclassmen, Jerem. Then don't lose any of these should-win games. Right? Upperclassmen should. practicing for a long time, weaker schedule. Yes, Navy is not a should-win game. 
Army is not a should-win game, and Houston is not. The rest, I think, should win games. So win at least all of those, if not more, right? Okay. Okay. Coming up, another missionary dunking. And you've waited long enough. It is time for our first ever Not Top 5. We're over 1,800 shows into this thing, and we've never done a Not Top 5. Between the Lines did it back in the day. <laughs> this is BYU oh boy. Station. Oh boy. Watch out for the wall! <laughs> this segment of BYU Sports Nation, presented by... Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We continue with the daily reminder. The show is available anytime on demand via the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. Go ahead and uh, subscribe, rate, and review to our podcast by Googling BYU Sports Nation Podcast. It is time for Not Top 5 Tuesday, presented by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. And, uh, yeah, Top 5 Tuesdays generally feature some of the best moments in BYU history. Today, not so much. These ones left to scratching our heads. Jerem, start us off. Number five, before BYU got beat handily by Wisconsin in 2017 at home, there was a parachutist representing the Navy SEALs gliding into Lavelle and saying, well, he goes into the North Barrier. Oh! Seems like he was okay, he or she. Um, And we saw this on Canada Kickoff. We were like, that looked painful. Is he okay? We should have known it was going to be a terrible day for BYU yeah. football against Wisconsin huh? when this opened it up. Look at the Red Sea part. The ROTC is like, uh, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Number four. We've all seen missed field goals. Oh, those kickers. Uh, we've even seen some that weren't close. Then there's this from Justin Sorensen. It's hard to even see where the ball is. Watch that. <laughs> Wide left. Just a, just a bit outside. What happened? <laughs> Listen, I love Justin. From a whopping 28 tough. yards away. Yeah, that was rough. <laughs> J.D. falls on like, the hold. I feel like that's what I would do. J.D., what happened, man? <laughs> yeah, I blame J.D. Uh, three. When second stringer Bo Hodge got a concussion against Utah State, Coy Detmer Jr. took over and started warming up, drops the pass, and Tanner Mangum gives a look that I think we all kind of gave, which was like, oh, no. Uh, what's going to happen? <laughs> Look at Tanner Mangum's face. Tanner's in a boot. He's hurt. He got hurt against Utah. Utah State. Coy Detmer drops uh, this, and then Tanner's like, oh, boy. It's going to be rough. <laughs> Coy Detmer Jr. went on to great success, by the way, what? in Texas uh, at a smaller school hey, in D2 or D3. He tore it up, baby. Yeah. yeah. yeah Tanner's <laughs> oh, no. And that typified the 2017 season. At number two, Boise State. 2018. Okay. Oh. Do we have to? <laughs> Fourth and 19. Your own five yard line. Nothing else needs to be said. Let us take in a moment of silence for what happened that night. There's a mini miracle. A moment that of silence, Spencer. Thank you. Continue. <laughs> There's a mini miracle that happened after this play, Jerem. What happened? Boise State did not score. Who cares? And the not top five number one play, Jake Keeps, Utah, 2011. Tries to pick up and throw fumble snaps, slips through his hands. This would also typify, unfortunately, the career of Jake Keeps at BYU, and that was really rough. That was a terrible day. 54-10, was that the score? I've literally put it out of my mind. Yes. I was uh, the sideline reporter on the game for us. Oh, and oh, and by the way, Utah dropped uh, eight. and uh, No, they, they dropped nine. Jeremy. No, there were three there. Watch there, three. Oh, okay, okay. But, uh, yeah. A delayed but third you're, you're missing the point! <laughs> Jake lost the ball. You know what? You know who dropped one? Jake Keeps. Okay, but bad snap, okay? Bad snap, and then it was it just got worse from there. Okay? Really? The snap is what we're highlighting here. Well, I'm saying it's... it's <laughs> what happened? Oh. I'm still upset about that nine years later. <laughs> of course, we're going to go from the not top, not top five to this question. Of the Why do day. we have to end by showing those plays? <laughs> I'm, I'm no. just bugged now. It's amazing. We go from that to the, this question. <laughs> Is this season BYU's best chance at playing in a New Year's Six Bowl game? We're on both ends of the spectrum on this show, <laughs> why, man. Why not? Our lead voice of the day presented by Sundance Mountain Resort from LJ Pearson, one on Twitter. Blue goggles firmly on. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Due to clean living. Get out of here. Staying healthy. That has nothing to do with this. Following the honor code. What of, does that have to do with anything? BYU stripling warriors will conquer all and be the last team standing by New Year's. Don't bring religion into this. It doesn't help BYU win. <laughs> Our rise and shout out today, speaking of, goes to a missionary, <laughs> Tate Romney, who is winning at 
in the mission field. Uh, Tate Romney can dunk. Woo, Tate! Oh, you gotta love a carpeted church gym, right? Romney family represent. Throwing it out the glass! Nothing screams uh, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ like a carpeted church. Our thanks to today's guest, Cam Miller of SP Nation. Sorry to Dennis, but in no time. But we did have time for Gordon Hudson, who was in the college football hall. Did we ever find out which the number Dennis wore? Was it 91? Oh, it might have been 91. I don't know. I don't really care. For Jeremiah Spencer, <laughs> shout out to Tavita Ophahengele. We'll see you tomorrow on BYU Sports Nation. Go Cougs. Throw it down, Tate.